You know, there's a great statesman and lawyer named Daniel Webster. Many of y'all remember him from history. He was a powerful orator and he gave early evidence of having a quick mind and quick wit. Well, one day Webster's father was gone from home and he had given his two boys, Daniel and Ezekiel, some clear instructions on what they were supposed to accomplish. Well, they went about their day and they decided they weren't going to do a single thing their dad had asked them to do. Well, when their father returned home, he came in and he says, Ezekiel, what have you been doing all day? Nothing. And he was a little perturbed, obviously, because he had given clear instructions for the boys to accomplish something. So he turns to Daniel and he says, Daniel, what have you been doing all day? Well, I've been helping Ezekiel. <laughs> you know, we like to come up with excuses for why we don't do some things, right? We also have some issues where we refuse to do things. That is the title of the message today. It is called, Why Do People Refuse to Follow Jesus? As we continue in our journey through the book of Mark. You know, last week we saw in our passage that we examined Jesus was in the midst of his second cleansing of the temple and he tossed the temple tables and he drove them out of the court of the Gentiles and then he also did a very interesting thing which only Mark recorded. He stopped all of the offerings and the sacrifices that took place. Mark says he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. This meant that he stopped the priest, this meant that all of the sacrifices that were part of their normal duties were, were hindered and stopped, and he would not allow them to continue. Jesus was exercising his authority as God in the flesh over that process. Well, this was a very dangerous thing and daring thing for Jesus to do. Why? Because he was challenging the authority of the priests, and everyone was shocked and stunned by his actions. These sacrifices, if you remember, were at the heart of all that they were as a people. They, they focused on temple worship and what took place in the temple as a nation. Yet here was Jesus on his own authority, bringing this sacrificial priestly system to a complete halt, stopped it in its tracks. This would be equivalent to seeing the, the late Billy Graham getting up in a pulpit and proclaiming the word and then taking the Bible and tearing it apart into pieces. It would be shocking. It would be something that would cause great, uh, great concern for those that would witness those things. Well, most of the temple complex was a massive courtyard for the Gentiles. Now, we don't know from the Bible how much occupied uh, that area by those that were selling animals and being the, the coin changers. But we do know that Jesus single-handedly got them all driven from the court. He did it by himself, and he shut down their activities. Well, in response to affecting the way that they were earning their illegitimate funds from the, the people that came to worship, they were looking for a way to kill him, we saw in verse 18. Well, you would think after stirring all of these things up that Jesus might go and recuse himself, himself for a while and, and uh, find a place of hiding. Well, that's not what he did. He returns to Jerusalem the very next day with courage, and he's looking for a fight. Not a physical confrontation, but a spiritual confrontation. That's why he was there. And he is using his own authority and his own claims against the Sanhedrin about what they were doing. And the stakes are much higher now because you remember he was attacking the Pharisees as he was traveling around the region. But when he comes into Jerusalem, this is the heart of the, the whole authority of the nation of Israel. This would be like us going to Washington, D.C. and challenging the Congress and the president. That's what Jesus was ultimately doing here in, in a religious sense. Well, in this passage, we see that things are going to heat up. And we see that this is going to facilitate what Jesus' ultimate mission is on this earth. And that is to go to the cross. To provide us reconciliation with God. Well, in this passage, we're going to see some very common reasons as to why people refuse to follow Jesus. Not much has changed, unfortunately, in 2,000 years. 
The same kinds of excuses, the same reasons that were used in this passage of Scripture are used today for people to refuse to follow Jesus. Let's begin by reading in chapter 11 of the Gospel of Mark. We're going to begin with verse 27. Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 27. They came again to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came and asked him, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are in authority of all, that you are the creator of the universe. We pray your blessings on this time as we study your word. We pray that you will open our hearts and minds to the truth that you want us to see. And Lord, I pray that the words that come from my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be found acceptable in your sight. You are my rock, my strength, and my redeemer. I give you all praise, honor, and glory for what you're going to do at this time. And it's in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing that we see from these opening verses is that they refuse to submit to Jesus' authority. They refuse to submit to his authority. Jesus is clearly showing that he is in charge of the temple. He's in charge of worship. And they're like, well, whose authority do you have to do these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Well, we see that Jesus came to Jerusalem for a reason. And we see him confront the Sanhedrin here. Now, who is the Sanhedrin? The Sanhedrin is the Jewish high court, essentially. And they are the ultimate authority over all of Israel. And this group consisted of 71 men, which included the high priest, a vice chief justice, and then 69 other general members. Only the chiefs, the high priests, and the elders, or excuse me, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes were eligible to sit on the council of the Sanhedrin. And their power was enormous. They had tremendous influence over the society in which they were in. And anything that would threaten that power and that authority was an affront to them. And Jesus was clearly a threat. That's why they wanted to kill him. That's why they wanted to destroy him. Well, this group that approached Jesus was most likely a delegation, not the entire 71 members. This was probably just a handful of them. And in the immediate context of their interrogation was concerning the actions that took place in the passage that we looked at last week. They were asking, who gave you the right to wreak havoc in our temple? Who gave you the authority to disrupt our marketplace? Well, since Jesus wasn't a priest, since he wasn't a Pharisee or an elder, these men wanted to know by what authority that Jesus was doing these things. And the phrase, these things, refers to the things that just happened in the passage we looked at earlier. They wanted Jesus to say, this was their goal, that he had no authority to do what he did. And that he acted out of his own accord. So they come to him with a, an ultimate question. Who gave you the authority to do this? Who told you that you can act this way? Well, that's the question behind all humanity, isn't it? That's the question behind all of our behavior. Who's in charge? Who gives you the authority to do the things that you do? When you refine that issue down to its essentials, what you have left is the whole issue of authority in life. Why do you act the way you do? By whose authority do you act the way that you act? How do you justify what you say and what you do? Because if you live long enough, you'll realize that ultimately we all are under the authority of somebody, no matter how high up the hierarchy we get. No man is ever his own ultimate authority. We all refer to something or someone other than ourselves. Something or someone compels us. Something or someone we feel is more important than we are, and it governs our decisions. And when we deal with the question of authority, essentially, we're dealing with the absolute basic fundamental to all human behavior. As the official guardians of the law, the members of the Sanhedrin had both the right and the authority and responsibility to investigate anyone who was claiming authority and to be sent by God. And that included Jesus. So they weren't out of line by questioning him. However, they did not have sincere motives. They really didn't care what he was going to say. They weren't seeking the truth. 
They were looking for evidence that they could use to destroy him and kill him and put him to death. They were setting a trap. The people in the crowds had seen Jesus in his ministry with his disciples. They'd seen him teach with authority. As we've gone through the book, you'll notice he teaches with such authority. Where does this power come from? All of those questions were affirming who Jesus was. So he taught with authority. He cast out demons with authority. He healed with authority. He had done what only God could do. He was and is God in the flesh. Their goal wasn't to recognize that. Their goal was to trap him and ensnare him and embarrass him and discredit him so that they could have their way with him. And they felt like they set a great trap. If he admits that he has no religious credentials and that he's acting on his own authority, then he's going to lose respect with the crowd, right? And then what happens if he claims authority from God? He's going to be blasphemous, right? Because he didn't fit into the system. So then if he blasphemed God, then they could arrest him. They could start the process of putting him to death. Either way, in their minds, this man who was disrupting all that they were about was going to meet his end. The question of authority is very important for us to examine, folks, because we all have a source of authority in our lives. Someone or something guides us. Someone or something drives us and pushes us forward. Something that rules over us. And for most of us, just like the Sanhedrin in this world, we're really not interested in surrendering our rule to anyone, right? Where do we place ourselves? On the throne, right? It's all about me. What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? Well, the Sanhedrin thought they possessed all authority. But Jesus didn't recognize their authority one iota. In fact, Jesus claimed to have greater authority than they thought they had. And it was irritating them because they, in their minds, were in charge. In the Bible, Jesus claimed incredible authority. In fact, Jesus claimed all authority in all the universe. Matthew 28, 18 tells us, And Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me on, in heaven and on earth. All authority. Not some, not a portion, not a part, not just a little bit given to me. He said all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's all of creation, folks. There's no one else in the universe, there's nothing else in the universe that holds more power and authority than Jesus. And this explains why Jesus didn't think he needed permission from the Sanhedrin to cross the temple tables and to clear the court of the Gentiles, to get the crooks out of the house of the Lord. Jesus is as high of an authority as you can go. Paul said it this way in Philippians 2. Verses 10 and 11, he says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in earth and on earth, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Every created living thing on earth, even under the earth, will bow to the knee to Jesus Christ. The question is, Will you do it willingly or will you be forced to do it? Every knee will bow because Jesus has the authority to command it. He holds the position of the highest authority in all of creation. Here, the Sanhedrin, they, they refused to submit to his authority. They knew they were trying to set a trap. Jesus knew it as well. So he countered their question as we move along with another question to expose their hypocrisy. Let's continue, verse 29. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Who was John's baptism, or excuse me, was John's baptism from heaven or of human origin? Answer me. They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they were afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John was truly a prophet. Jesus gives them a question. He's going to expose them for who they really are. And in the process, 
we see that they refuse to see the evidence that Jesus presents to them. By asking this question, Jesus isn't trying to be difficult. His response was done in a traditional rabbinical style. When you were a, a, a student, you would go to your rabbi and ask a question. And if you wanted a response, he had the ability to ask you a question before he answered yours. And that's exactly what Jesus was exercising here. So he asked, was the baptism of John the Baptist from heaven or of human origin? From heaven was literally saying what? From God. So was his baptism from God or was it from human origin, from man? In other words, John the Baptist was a prophet sent from God. So if he was a prophet sent from God, then you should have listened to him. Or was he just some crazy man running around in the wilderness wearing a, a, a crazy coat and eating locusts? That's what they wanted Jesus to say. But that's not who he was. John the Baptist was very clear about his mission. And Jesus, by asking this question, was putting them between a rock and a hard place. And Jesus would only tell them where his authority came from if they answered this question about John's authority. And the reason he did it is because we know from reading the scripture that John the Baptist and Jesus are a package deal. If you believe in one, you're going to believe in the other. If you reject one, you're ultimately rejecting the other. To accept the authority meant you needed to accept the authority of the other one and to reject it likewise. What did John do? He came to prepare the way, right? You remember when Jesus and John first met? They were in the womb. And what happened? When Jesus came near, John kicked in the womb of his mother. Who was born first? John the Baptist was born first. You need to remember that. John was a prophet from God. And it meant you needed to accept his word and believe his word that Jesus was the very son of God, the Messiah. Look at the evidence that John the Baptist provided in his own words as we look to the scripture. John 1, 23. He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as Isaiah the prophet said. Well, John claimed all he was doing was preparing the way for the arrival of the Lord. So if John the Baptist said that he was preparing for the arrival of Jesus, that would solve the question of the authority, right? Because Jesus is Lord. And if he admitted that Jesus is Lord, then that meant that Jesus is God. Look what else John the Baptist said about, his, about Jesus and his identity and his authority. John 1, 29 through 30. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. John the Baptist identified Jesus as what? The very Lamb of God. And he also said that even though Jesus was born after him, he existed before him. Jesus has always existed. He has been there from the beginning. All creation was through him, by him, and for him. And Jesus existed in eternity past. And that means what? Only one thing. That Jesus is God. Let's see what else John says about Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 30. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. John was backing away because he was not an authority. Jesus was moving to the forefront because he was uh, an authority over all. John made it very clear about who Jesus was and what authority that he possessed. Well, the Sanhedrin certainly remembered John's fiery sermons that he preached and his insistence that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was truly the Messiah. So the link between the two answered the Sanhedrin's question about who Jesus really was and where his identity and his authority came from. Jesus clearly wanted a response from them. How do we know? Because he says, answer me. That's an imperative it's not found in any of the other Gospels. It demands a response. It's, it demands a commitment for them to make. One way or the other. Either you confess or you deny. You're going to answer me. Something the Bible makes very clear is this. God does not teach us a new truth if we've rejected the truth he's already revealed. 
How do I know that? Well, the basic principle is expressed in John 7, 17. It says, if anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own. The Jewish religious leaders here had not accepted what John had taught. Therefore, they were not willing to accept what Jesus was teaching. So why would God say any more to them? Why would God say anything more to them? Had they obeyed John's message? Had they done that? They would have gladly submitted to Jesus Christ. Because John came to pave the way for the Messiah. Well, the Jewish leaders were caught in the dilemma of their own making. They were not asking what is true. They were not asking what is right. Instead, they were asking, all right, what is safe for us? How should we respond to this question? That's always the approach of a hypocrite and the person who wants to be a crowd pleaser. And that's certainly where they were. Notice a particular nuance of Jesus' question here. He says about John the Baptist. He doesn't ask about the ministry of John the Baptist. He asks about the baptism of John the Baptist. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from human origin? You see, John's baptism was something different. It was something new. It was something that had never occurred before. The priests, of course, had many hand-washing and washing rituals that they exercised in the temple worship and that was connected to their duties under the Levitical law. But it was always done in the temple and it was always done according to prescribed methods. And here John the Baptist comes along. He's doing something they've never seen before. He's doing something different. John wasn't a priest, yet he was baptizing. And he did it in the rivers. He did it in the streams. He did it wherever he could find enough water to immerse people under the water and up out of the water. It was something quite new. And it would immediately arouse the question, by whose authority are you doing this to bring a new ritual to Israel? So Jesus seizes upon that. And he's basically saying to these men of the Sanhedrin, what do you think of the innovation of John? Was the baptism he practiced from God or was it from man? The same question that they're posed with. Well, Jesus succinctly simplifies the issue and he clears away all the non-essentials. He says basically all authority is either from God or it's from man. There are no other authorities. We're either trying to please God and we're going to obey him or we're going to try and please men and follow after them and their authority. So here we find the leaders in 31 and 32 in a verbal trap, and they knew it immediately. If they answered from heaven, meaning John's authority came from God, then they would be condemned by the people, and the people would come after them because they rejected what John's message was. On the other hand, to say he has authority or that his authority was not from God would risk the wrath of the people. That verb discuss there means that they discussed Jesus' question among themselves for some time. They didn't go off and just have a huddle and say, all right, break. They were there for a while. We got to figure this out, guys. We got to give him the right answer or we're going to be really messed up. We're going to be in a bind. But Jesus twice commands them and asks them, answer me. Answer me. The implication by that response from Jesus is that they didn't have the courage or the wherewithal to answer the question honestly. But notice something that's not there. They never deny the evidence that Jesus provided. They never deny what he said as they huddle together to draft their response. The struggle they have with how to set it aside. How do we move this evidence out of the way so that we can answer what he's saying? Because the evidence is insurmountable. And it indicated that they were wrong that they were the ones at fault, yet they refused to see Jesus for who he was. And it was to their own spiritual peril. The evidence is there, folks. But the hearts of these men would not embrace it. Why? They wanted to put a rational argument ahead to Jesus. And because of it, because of their fear, of losing control, of losing influence, of losing their position, of losing power and losing their way of life, they would not answer him directly. For so many people, that's the problem with the evidence. 
They like the life they're living. They're happy in their sin. They don't want to have someone with authority over them. They don't want to have someone who, giving them direction. The problem isn't external. It's internal. It's in us. It's sin. That's the problem with the world. If I accept that Jesus is the Son of God who died for my sins, raised from the dead on the third day, and I accept that and I believe it in my heart and I confess it with my mouth and I will be saved, what does that mean? That means my life is going to be different. My life is going to be transformed. There will be fruit of the Spirit in my life. But so many people say, you know what? I like my life the way it is. I like being in charge. I, I don't care about all this evidence you provided me. I'm going to reject it. It doesn't matter to me. They refuse to see the evidence. Now let's look at their response in verse 33. So they answered Jesus. Listen to this lame answer. We don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus gave them the opportunity to submit to his authority. And he provided them with the necessary evidence to make the right decision. But now we come to the most heartbreaking part of the whole passage. They refuse to seize the opportunity. They refuse to seize the opportunity. In the end, the only thing they could say without making any comment is, We don't know. I don't know. We don't know. I don't know. Why? We get a little insight from verse 18 and verse 32. In verse 18, it says they were afraid of Jesus that we looked at last week. And in verse 32, it says they were afraid because of the crowd. They were fearful. They were afraid. Their failure to make the decision and seize the opportunity was because of fear. Few things in life are more paralyzing than fear. According to a recent Gallup poll, do you know what more Americans fear than anything else? Snakes. And women fear snakes more than men. But snakes are number one on the list. It's more than heights. It's more than flying. It's more than death. It's more than being in the dark. It's more than going to the doctor. Fear of snakes is the number one fear in America today. It's more than public speaking. A lot of people have a fear of public speaking. It's more than fear of heights. It's more than fear of being enclosed in small spaces. There's more fear of snakes than spiders and other insects. It's more fear than shots and needles and mice and flying in an airplane. Well, in this text, God's word addresses a fear that is common to all of us. Fear of man. We fear what others think. We fear what others might say, don't we? Well, listen to what the Bible says about fear of man in Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man is a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. The one who trusts in the Lord is protected. You don't need to be fearful. You don't need to have anxiety. You don't need to be afraid of anything that can happen in your life. Because if you trust in the Lord, you are protected. Verse 32 lays bare what the core of the, the religious authorities were. They were afraid of the crowd and they were afraid because everyone thought that John was truly a prophet. They knew the truth. The crowd recognized who John was, but they didn't want to acknowledge it. And they also chose the only safe option for them to respond with. We don't know. <laughs> well, Jesus shuts them down. And he says, well, neither will I answer you by what authority I do these things. It's sad, isn't it? it truly is sad. What was expedient and safe was more important to them than what was true and right. We don't know. What a lie. What a lie. They knew exactly what was going on. But out of their fear, they chose the lame response. They would rather keep their position and live a lie than submit to Christ and walk in him and walk in the truth. They never had sincere motives. They never opened their minds to, to hear a different perspective. They were full of cowardice instead of courage. Now, if the Sanhedrin had tried to discredit John the Baptist publicly, things would not have gone well. 
Because the people believed John the Baptist was a great prophet, which he was. And what happened to John the Baptist? He was recently mur murdered by Herod the, Herod the Great, right? Well, the Gospel of Mark doesn't tell us all that would happen, but the Luke version fills in the blanks. Listen to what Luke 26 says. Luke 20, verse 6. But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are convinced that John is a prophet. So they were afraid they were going to get killed by the people. They were going to get stoned to death. They were worried they would be assassinated by them. They were worried they would lose their position and their power and their authority. They either admitted John the Baptist was a prophet of God, and then they would follow his words, which would mean admitting that Jesus is the very Son of God, and they were too far down the road to be able to admit it because of their pride. Or they needed to claim that John was nothing more than a crazy man in the wilderness. And if they chose that, they would have been killed by the people. So in that very moment, the religious leaders revealed their true character and why they were unqualified to lead God's people. We don't know. What a lame answer. Instead of representing God's people to help them find the truth, they were nothing more than politicians, political hacks, and cowards who would say only what the people wanted to hear to keep themselves in position and power. They weren't interested in the truth. They didn't care about the truth. They were more interested in maintaining their own position and bending the truth any way necessary to get to their goals. Well, the Gospel of John says it this way in John 12, 43. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. So here's a question for all of us to consider as we close. Especially if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you submitted to his authority ever? If you haven't, then what is holding you back? What excuse are you using? Why are you refusing to follow after Jesus if he's calling for you? Is it your desire to be the sole authority in your life and you don't want to submit? Folks, I understand that. I had that feeling once. I didn't want to submit, but I'm telling you, when I finally surrendered, it was beautiful. It's wonderful. Just like me and my wife in our marriage, when we submit to one another under the authority of God, it's a beautiful thing. You're not giving anything up. I can tell you, you are going to gain far more than you could ever hope for or imagine in life when you surrender to him. And since Jesus holds the position of the highest authority in the universe anyway, ask yourself, have I given him the position of highest authority in my life? Or am I still on the throne? It's easy for us to be just like the Sanhedrin folks. We like to think we're in charge of everything, and we know deep down in our spirits we're not. We're not in charge of anything. We can't extend the day, can we? Can we stop the moon from shining? Can we stop the stars from shining? Can we hold the moon in place for 24 hours or the sun in place for 24 hours? Can we add a minute to our lives by worrying? No, we cannot do anything. We can't change anything. We like to think that we can, but in reality, Jesus is the only one who has all authority. We need to repent, folks, if that's us. If we're still trying to be in charge, we need to repent and surrender. So I ask you, what areas in your life do you struggle with to give over to Jesus? Are you holding on to something? Are you holding on to something from your past? Maybe the, the devil has convinced you that you can never be forgiven by God because of something you've done. I don't know what that might be for you. It could be a number of things. But I'm here to tell you, if you ask for forgiveness, the Bible says God is faithful and just and he will forgive you. Do not fall for the lie of the enemy. Maybe you've got a different struggle. Maybe it's your difficulty to honestly Consider the evidence of who Jesus says he is. I've heard it described this way. The old dial watches, you know, that you wear. From the old days that a watchmaker would make, now everything's digital, so it, it really doesn't apply. But most of you know what an old watch is made like. For Jesus to fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament would have the same odds 
of a man taking a watch, disassembling it, throwing it up in the air, all the pieces, and it coming together and being a functioning watch again. That's how much evidence the Bible contains as to who Jesus said he was. It's truth. Historically, it's being proven as they dig in the Middle East and all around the world. For years and years, they said Pontius Pilate never existed. Well, guess what happened recently? They found engravings with his name on it. The Bible is proven to be accurate and truthful. You can believe the evidence. Don't struggle with it. Maybe your issues, you, you just fear what other people might think. Don't cower to that. Don't fall for the lie. And definitely don't be fearful of God. You should have a holy, reverent fear of who he is because he has the power of death and life. But don't be afraid of him. He created you. He loves you. He cares for you. Twice in this section of Mark, we see the leaders were afraid of people. The fear of man hindered them from moving towards Jesus. And they refused to seize their opportunity that was presented to them. So I want to ask you to be honest with yourself this morning, right now in this very moment. How much of your hesitation, how much of your doubt, how much of the unanswered questions are really just a mask to hide your fear of what faith in Jesus Christ might cost you? Is that what it really boils down to? How much will it cost? Will I have to change my lifestyle? Yes! Will I have to change the way I do things? Yes. Will I lose friends? Yes. Will I offend people? Yes. Are you willing to give those things up? That's the real question. Will you make a decision for Christ? If it costs you socially or culturally or relationally, or even financially, are you willing to do that? I implore you, look into the face of Jesus. He is there. His arms are open wide. Listen to his voice through his scriptures when he speaks. Don't ignore it. Read about and watch how much he loves his children. Ponder his evidence that he gives to prove that he is God. In the flesh and be willing to come to him be willing to follow him be willing to submit to his authority be willing to surrender to him and he will change your life the end result will be Christ transforming you and it will not disappoint you so I encourage you follow after Jesus and don't let anything get in your way let us pray